but ultimately the Affordable Care Act has problems that have to be fixed. So uh, my intention is to keep working on the fixes. We're going to repeal Obamacare. Repeal it, replace it, or save it. San Diego lawmakers and voters sounding off on the Republican plan to overhaul health care. You know, you just see a real difference in their spirit, and thus they're just not in pain, so they're happier and they're moving better. Finding pain relief for pets with marijuana, the one thing that could make this treatment available for all animals. You walk out into the middle of these flower fields and it smells like you're in a florist shop. Call it Mother Nature's Florist Shop, answering the call of wildflowers exploding now in the desert. KPBS Evening Edition starts right now. Good evening and thanks for joining us. I'm Ebony Monet. California has joined the legal fight against President Trump's travel ban. Attorney General Javier Becerra says the state is signing on to a new lawsuit filed today by Washington State. In a statement, Becerra said even though the text of the ban has changed, it's still an attack on people based on religion and nationality. Maryland, Massachusetts, New York, and Oregon also in the legal action. Trump's revised ban bars new visas for people from six predominantly Muslim countries. So Somalia, Iran, Syria, Sudan, Libya, and Yemen. It also temporarily shuts down the U.S. refugee program. With five eyes and two no's, the California legislature took one step closer to barring communication between local law enforcement and federal immigration officers. This so-called sanctuary state bill advanced out of the Appropriations Committee today. It would bar police and sheriffs from detaining people solely for immigration violations unless a judge issues a warrant. Nobody wants dangerous criminals in our communities. And President Trump has said he only intends to deport the quote-unquote bad hombres. But the actions of his administration tells us something different. Headlines from across the nation tell of arrests and deportations of folks who could hardly be described as dangerous. The bill was recently amended to allow California authorities to notify federal immigration officials 60 days before violent felons are released so they can be deported. Law enforcement representatives say it's not enough. There will be a full Senate vote on the measure later this month. There are new numbers out on the Republicans' health care overhaul. The Congressional Budget Office says 14 million people will lose coverage next year if the current House bill passes. Nonpartisan analysts say the number of uninsured would grow to 24 million by 2026. The White House says it disagrees strenuously with the budget analysts of the GOP plan to dismantle President Obama's health care law. San Diego Representative Scott Peters is holding a town hall meeting tonight at Claremont High School. It caps off a weekend of town halls held by fellow Democrat Susan Davis and local Republicans Daryl Issa and Duncan Hunter. Congressional Republicans' town hall meetings have been a battleground between Trump supporters and people who think the administration is on the wrong track. And Issa's and Hunter's meeting over the weekend were no exception. KPBS reporter Kenny Goldberg brings us this report from Ramona. About 250 people squeezed into the main stage theater in downtown Ramona. Hunter got things off to a rollicking start with his opening remarks. Number one, I'm ecstatic to have President Donald Trump as president. <laughs> Hunter said he's in favor of Trump's plan to secure the border by building a wall. And then Hunter delivered a line his supporters were waiting for. We're going to repeal Obamacare. <laughs> With that, Hunter started taking questions from the audience. He was asked about the Republican plan to replace Obamacare. Hunter said Obamacare is ruining our health care system. The Republican plan, he said, takes a better approach. It removes stifling government oversight. If we demonopolize it, we allow any insurance company to pop up, different hospitals to pop up, without a federal overarching tyranny over it, we will have less expensive insurance, less expensive health care, and things will be better. 
After the event, San Diego constituent Lynette Williams said she liked Hunter's position on Obamacare. We have to repeal because the first step out of Obamacare is socialized medicine. Bethany Amborn from El Cajon said Hunter seemed disconnected from the effects of Trump's policies. If he doesn't care about the things that are affecting us, then he shouldn't represent us. Hunter will be up for re-election next year. Kenny Goldberg, KPBS News. Congressman Issa faced a packed house for his town hall meetings. At least a thousand people showed up in Oceanside. I do not support a reduction in EPA's funding, okay? We will stand for health care. We will stand for our immigrant brothers and sisters. We will stand for A mixed reception for the Vista congressman this weekend from voters inside town hall and rallies outside Junior Seau Beach Community Center. Ma'am, ma'am, the current bill is not in a form that I approve of. I am trying to change it. But ultimately, the Affordable Care Act has problems that have to be fixed. So uh, my intention is to keep working on the fixes. The Republican lawmaker answered voters' questions from climate change to immigration. The most popular topic was the GOP plan to reform health care. But the fact is, I do not believe that we can strip away both employer and individual mandates and not find both a carrot and a stick to get people to be financially, fiscally responsible for their own decisions. Isis shared his thoughts on the bill making its way through Congress now. Well, I tell you here, I won't vote for something if it strips away the mandate. I'm not going to make that commitment. What I will tell you, what I will tell you is I will keep fighting for a recognition that that individual who chooses not to have insurance, in fact, should be held in great amount responsible. Police told KPBS News the protests outside the town halls stayed peaceful. The mayors of San Diego and Tijuana signed a memorandum of understanding today pledging to strengthen cooperation between the two cities. KPBS Metro reporter Andrew Bowen says the two mayors want to share how cross-border cooperation in economics, culture and public safety can be a good thing for both cities. The last time the mayors of San Diego and Tijuana signed an agreement like this was in 2014. Since then, there's a new mayor in Tijuana, and of course, there's been the election of Donald Trump, who's moving forward with plans to build a border wall and has vowed to cancel the free trade agreement that allowed so much cross-border cooperation to prosper. Por el apoyo en este evento. But the two mayors studiously avoided speaking directly about Donald Trump at their news conference. The focus was on their two local governments working more closely together on infrastructure, public safety and the environment. Oh. There was, however, one thinly veiled mention of Trump by Juan Manuel Gastelum, mayor of Tijuana. While some are thinking of walls, we will continue building bridges of understanding. San Diego Mayor Kevin Faulkner, like Trump, is a Republican. He's carefully avoided open conflict with the president. Instead, he's opting to put forward the San Diego-Tijuana relationship as a counterexample to Trump's narrative of Mexicans murdering Americans or stealing their jobs. We do cooperate, we do collaborate, and we do come together. And since our city signed the agreement in 2014, we have seen many positive results. Now, in terms of how the cities are actually going to implement this agreement, the mayor spoke of joint trainings between their fire departments and regular meetings between their various department heads to keep those cross-border relationships fresh and strong. Reporting from Tijuana, Andrew Bowen, KPBS News. Leaders in South Bay are demanding action following a sewage spill in the Tijuana River. More than 140 million gallons of raw sewage spilled into the river in Mexico last month. The contaminated water flowed into the U.S. State health officials say water quality has improved along the Imperial Beach shoreline. City leaders from Chula Vista, Gornado, National City, Imperial Beach, and San Diego sent this letter to groups and lawmakers who can help fast-track water quality improvements. They wanted to share residents' frustration with their water woes, saying they want to see action on protecting the water quality in Tijuana River. Financial interests behind San Diego's San Diego deals worth billions are undisclosed. A city law sets out to change that to prevent conflicts of interest and criminal acts. But iNews source reporter Brad Racino finds the law has been practically ignored for 25 years. 
So, Brian, what's 225? 225 is a section of the San Diego City Charter. It's a law, and it's called the Mandatory Disclosure of Business Interests. And what it says is that any company doing business with the city, whether that's through a franchise or a lease or a real estate deal, has to disclose who's behind that company. It's not enough just to say ABC LLC. They need to know who stands to benefit, who the real people are behind that transaction. So how did San Diego come to have a law like 225? It's actually a really interesting story. In the early 90s, the city of San Diego almost entered into a $47 million real estate deal with an alleged mobster, the second highest ranking member of the mafia. Once the San Diego City Council found out who this person was, they nixed the deal, it fell apart. But because of that, there was this outcry of saying, you know, well, we should never be doing business with someone we don't know who's, who it is, who's behind this. So the voters that, that same year uh, voted, 86% of voters approved a law saying we need to know who's behind these businesses. And since then, in 1992, I believe it was, we've had this law on the books saying we need to know who we're doing business with. So that was 25 years ago. How is it that it's still not being enforced today? That's a good question. And since that time, there have been three separate city attorneys who have recommended to the city council that this policy be enforced or at least adjusted so that it can be enforced because some of the criticism was that it's a little too vague. So they've made recommendations, policy considerations and recommendations saying here's how we can do it. And every time it's just gone away. It's just disappeared into the ether and nothing has happened because of it. So, Brad, is there a powerful vocal opposition to enforcing 225 or is it just silently being ignored? It seems to be silently ignored. There hasn't been anybody who's come out and said we shouldn't do this. I mean, 86 percent of voters approve this and everyone I've talked to in my investigation has said, oh, yeah, we should be enforcing this. But like you said, 25 years and nothing has happened. There's something going on, but we don't know what it is. What can council members do now? Well, and we published our first investigation in August. In October, last October 2016, this went before the Rules Committee, it's a council uh, subcommittee, and they brought it up and said, we're gonna deal with this. Well, since October, nothing has happened. So in the last few weeks, I knew Source has been prompting some city council members saying, what's going on with this? And now three separate city council members are, are doing this and it's gonna come before the June 7th Rules Committee meeting where they're going to bring it up again and say, what can be done? So why now, after 25 years, why would council members be taking this on? Not to pat ourselves on the back too much, but it's because we've been asking questions. We've been hounding them, saying, this is an old law. Why is it not being enforced? I have talked to David Alvarez, council member David Alvarez, several times. I've talked to councilwoman Barbara Bree. Um, I've been in touch with Myrtle Cole's office. I've been trying to talk to the mayor's office about this. So we've just been on them, saying, what is going on, and let us know. And since then, there has been some action on the issue. So why is 225 so important? Why should people care about this? Transparency in city government is the most important thing, at least for reporters, but it should be for citizens as well. We need to know where our tax dollars are going. Um, you know, it's not enough. Someone shouldn't be able to hide behind a, what's called a Delaware LLC and cloak their, their identity. There could be corruption. There could be you know, dark money flowing. There's avenues here where politicians could be getting bribes, not saying that that is happening, but it's an avenue for a, a lot of bad things to happen. And taxpayers should be very concerned about where their money is going and who it's paying. Brad Racino, thanks for asking those tough questions. Thank you. Imagine having a debt-free college experience. It's part of an ambitious plan by state lawmakers. They announced the plan today aimed at picking up the tab for tuition and living expenses at the UC and Cal State systems. Part of the proposal also lets full-time community college students attend their first year for free. Too often, college is out of reach and unattainable for middle class and lower income families. And those that do uh, get there, they graduate with mountains of debt. And so today we're saying that we're going to take a bold step forward looking to, uh, to, to, to address these rising tuition costs, rising college costs. This proposal would cost the state nearly $2 billion. 
On this date, 120 years ago, the school now known as San Diego State University was created. Then Governor James Budd signed a bill authorizing the State Normal School of San Diego. Its mission was to train teachers. SDSU says back then, in 1897, they started with seven faculty members and 91 students. It became San Diego State University in the early 70s. Happy birthday. Have you heard about the so-called super bloom of wildflowers going on in the desert right now? Apparently, a lot of people have because the area was mobbed this weekend, prompting a traffic advisory. But some who made the trip say the sights were well worth it. KPBS reporter Claire Tregesser has the story. Heavy rains this winter have turned the normally barren desert east of San Diego into a carpet of flowers. From wild canterbury bells, desert evening primrose, and desert dandelions, the hills and canyons around Anza Borrego Desert State Park are covered with color. The blooms only last a few weeks, so many visitors are flooding the area to take in the rare views, including some visitors from outside the San Diego area. Marianne Bloom, Yes, that's her real name, traveled from Laguna Beach to spend a few days in Borrego Springs. We went up the Coyote Canyon, I think it was, and it was just amazing. The flowers were, you, you walk out into the middle of these flower fields and it smelled like you were in a floor shop. Just, and little, little things popping up all over. She'd never come to the desert to see the wildflowers before, but decided to go when she heard about the big bloom. And plus it was just a really special um, bloom this year. In the coming weeks, more flowers are expected to blossom. Those include ocotillo and beaver tail cactus. So there may be different flowers for different visitors to see. Claire Tregesser, KPBS News. See the super bloom for yourself on our KPBS photo gallery. We also have more information on where you can find those wildflowers thriving on KPBS.org. <clears throat> if you have driving plans tonight, make sure to be careful. A dense fog could settle into parts of the region. Stephanie Omo has tonight's forecast. Mainly quiet conditions tonight as we slowly begin to wrap up the day today here across uh, the San Diego area. Notice satellite and radar really not picking up much of anything. The storm track remaining well up to the north, impacting the northwestern portion of the country. I'll get to that in just a moment here, but notice just mainly clear skies, but we will be dealing with dense fog through the overnight hours. I do remind you, we do have a dense fog advisory out and into effect through the overnight, so you definitely have to take it easy on the roads, especially for tomorrow morning's commute. Temperatures tonight down to at around 58 degrees in the metro area. As we check out tonight's forecast in San Diego County and Borrego Springs, clear to partly cloudy skies down to Ramona. Temperatures tonight will be at 47 degrees, Alpine at 50. Mount Laguna will be dropping it down into the 40s, so a bit chilly here for tonight. But hey, great news is uh, many folks will be enjoying that sunshine into the next couple of days. High pressure system really locked in place. It's a strong high. Many folks will actually be uh, talking about near record warm temperatures in many locations out into the southwest. We'll be talking about temperatures well above the normal for this time of year. Now, high pressure system pretty much going to stick around with us throughout the course of this week, getting in that warm flow. Notice the storm track well up to the north. We do have that jet stream up northward that's pretty much bringing in the uh, storms around the uh, northern portion of the region here. So the northwest. We'll see more rain throughout the course of this week. But for us, we're nice, dry, and also mild. Uh, and that expands further inland as well. So notice Futurecast showing us Wednesday, Thursday, all the storms just targeting Washington down into Oregon. But we're mainly quiet from San Francisco south into Los Angeles. And well, in our area as well, San Diego, and even further inland as well. So your five-day outlook along the coast. Temperatures in the 70s were pretty mild throughout the course of the week. We'll be dealing with some foggy issues through the overnight hours, early morning hours, Wednesday, Thursday as well. 
The temperatures will be at 75 as we wrap up the work week on Friday. A little bit further inland, also many folks enjoying that sunshine and also pleasant conditions. We'll be warming up into the 80s, falling back into the 70s for the first part of the weekend. Into the mountains, we'll be back into the 60s beginning on Wednesday with bright sunshine, bright sunny skies through the uh, next couple of days or so with that high pressure system remaining locked in place. The desert, it's going to be hot, so I do recommend to put on the sunblock and also stay hydrated as we continue throughout the course of the week and we'll notice temperatures will be soaring into the 90s. I'm Stephanie Elmo, KPBS News. After a meticulous restoration that took more than a year, a Stradivarius violin stolen from a violinist Roman Totenberg is about to return to the stage. Associated Press reporter Ted Shaffrey says a former student of Totenberg's will play the instrument tonight at a private concert in New York. Now it has a little bit more golden sound. Violinist Mira Wang is exploring the possibilities of the Ames Stradivarius violin. It's like rediscover a sleeping beauty. This long missing instrument was built almost 300 years ago by renowned violin maker Antonio Stradivari. It was stolen from Wang's teacher, Roman Totenberg, back in 1980. It's like somebody took your arm just for fun, and they never return it. The violin was finally recovered in 2015, after the presumed thief died. The instrument has undergone a meticulous restoration. Basically what we found, the violin had been pretty much neglected, so um, the, the guy had obviously glued it himself. There was signs of super glue, Elmer's glue. But otherwise, the violin was in good shape. Totenberg did not live to see the instrument returned. But his former student will bring the violin to the stage on Monday for a private concert, its first since being restored. So one can see it, it's really almost in the perfect condition. We call it like, looks like a new violin, although of course it's over 300 years old. The instrument is now owned by Totenberg's children and is likely worth millions of dollars. Ted Shaffrey, Associated Press, New York. And if that name, Totenberg, sounds familiar to you, one of the three children who now own the Stradivarius is Nina Totenberg, the legal affairs correspondent for NPR. Coming up tonight on PBS NewsHour, running a marathon in below freezing temperatures. Why some runners in Russia wouldn't want it any other way. I love this place. Like, I think temperature is pretty warm today. I expected it to be colder, but I think it's, it's a good start for me to start ice running. Plus, Al Gore slams the EPA chief for downplaying carbon dioxide's role in climate change. That's tonight on PBS NewsHour, starting at 7, right here on KPBS. As more states legalize marijuana, pet owners are giving their dogs and cats cannabis to treat everything from anxiety to arthritis. Associated Press reporter Terry Che has a story. Portugal. Hudson has always been a happy, fun-loving dog, but the 12-year-old Portuguese water dog slowed down considerably after her arthritis worsened and a toe was amputated. And so she's in pain a lot of the time and you know, doesn't want to go out for walks, and we don't want to give her painkillers because they just knock her out. Sit. So Michael Fassman tried an alternative medicine that many humans use to treat their own pain and illness, marijuana. He gives Hudson a cannabis tincture that's made specifically for pets, adding the extract to her food. Look. She's livelier. She's more engaged. She's happy to see us. She wants to go out for walks. And she seems like she's not in as much pain. Or she's in pain, she doesn't care as much. It's hard to know. And this one works a lot faster than the other. As more states legalize marijuana for humans, more pet owners are giving the drug to their animals to treat everything from anxiety to cancer. Their two siblings got adopted yesterday. Lynn Tingle runs a pet adoption center and a sanctuary for animals who can't find homes. She often gives cannabis to older dogs with health or behavior issues. And she plans to start trying it with cats. You know, you just see a real difference in their spirit and that's 
they're just not in pain, so they're happier and they're moving better, and they just get a new lease on life, which is, you know, a terrific thing to see. Look at those pretty teeth. Huh? Veterinarians say there isn't enough scientific data to show that cannabis is safe and effective for treating pets. And vets can't prescribe or recommend marijuana because it's illegal under federal law. Science is not leading the discussion on this, and that's what we need to happen. We need to have the studies, we need to have the science, so we have the background information to make these informed decisions. San Francisco-based TreatWell Health says its products can treat a wide range of ailments, but don't get the animals high. What we find is a lot of the animals are coming to us when there's no other option, when pharmaceuticals haven't worked for that animal. And so again, they're at that last resort, and cannabis is really good for those types of situations. Treatwell tinctures have been selling well at Harborside Health Center, one of California's largest marijuana dispensaries. So I see a tremendous amount of potential. I think we still have a lot to learn about these products and their efficacy and how they work. With little guidance from veterinarians, some pet owners are deciding on their own that cannabis is right for their four-legged companions. Sit. Terry Che, Associated Press, San Francisco. You can find tonight's stories on our website, kpbs.org slash evening edition. Thank you for joining us. Have a great evening.